guys, welcome back. Today I'm here to talk about all the books that I read in the first half of August. videos a few months ago because I do read so many books in a month and so doing a mid-month wrap-up helps make my end of month wrap-ups not quite so insanely long. So today we're going to talk about all of the books that I read in the first half of August. I'm filming this on the 15th so this is all the books that I've read up till now and I have finished 13 books. So in terms of amount of reading done, this month has been really great. You know, July was a little bit of a lower reading month for me. This month has been really fantastic. I've gotten through a lot of books and some chunkers too, as we will talk about. I did also have one DNF, so I'll talk about that. And there's been a few disappointments this month, but also some really great books. So let's go ahead and get into this. So for my end of month wrap ups, I always talk about my books starting with my lowest rated books moving to my highest rated books. But for mid month wrap ups, I just talk about the books in the order that I read them. Oh, I actually think I had two DNFs. I did. I had two. So first I'll talk about my DNFs. The first one is Rouge by Richard Kirschenbaum, a novel of beauty and rivalry. This was sent to me for review by FSB Associates. And I appreciate the opportunity to read this. It sounded like a really interesting premise, but it ended up really not being for me, unfortunately. This follows four women in the 1920s or so who were part of starting the beauty industry. And I think this is kind of modeled on some real life figures who did that. My issues with this was that it came across as kind of sexist and racist in a variety of ways. And I just couldn't deal with it anymore. So I ended up DNFing it at I think around 30 or 40 percent of the book. I think 40 percent. If you guys want to hear a little bit more specifics on my thoughts on it, my Goodreads is always linked down below and I did write a little review of why I DNFed that one. The other book that I DNFed this month I think is just more a matter of like personal taste. This was The Misadventures of a Curvy Girl by Sierra Simone. It is adult romance and it was on sale as an ebook and I thought, you know what, let me give this a try. It's like a novella and as you know, one of her other books is on my TBR right now so I thought I would give her stuff a try and see how I got along with it. I liked the premise in terms of having a female main character who's curvy and it's very body positive. Unfortunately, this was really not the book for me. I ended up DNFing it at around 40%. While I don't have a problem reading romance novels that have explicit sex scenes in them. I prefer books that are not really erotica but have a lot more of a plot to them and this book was definitely much more erotica than it was romance. Like the plot mostly existed for the sake of the sexual activity which is just not really my thing. Also it involved a trio of people which I was like well let me just try this and see see how I got along with it. Like the way it was handled I didn't super love. It was like with two guys and a girl. There's also I think some like kind of light BDSM stuff being introduced there and like with with one of the guys being more dominant and I just don't particularly like any of that. I know some people do. That's fine. So it was a good learning experience. <laughs> it was a good learning experience. Um, so now I'm nervous about I'm still gonna give it a try, but now I'm wondering if I'll end up DNFing that. We'll, we'll see how it goes. I, I don't think it's like bad for what it is probably, just not my cup of tea. Moving on, let's talk about the books that I did finish reading. The first one was The Unhoneymooners by Christina Lauren. This was my first Christina Lauren book. I know a lot of people really love them as romance authors, and so I thought I would give them a try. I listened to this on audio from my library, and I ended up giving it three stars. So I think I'm in the minority on this one, but there were a few things that I didn't love about it. I definitely understand why some people are really into it. It's pretty well crafted as a romantic comedy. Unhoneymooners follows a guy and a girl who kind of clash, they don't get along very well, but their siblings, are getting married and at the wedding everybody but them who eats from the seafood buffet gets sick from food poisoning like really sick from food poisoning and the bride had won this big honeymoon trip to Hawaii obviously they now can't go so the siblings who don't like each other decide to go on this all paid vacation honeymoon trip to Hawaii and sparks fly so the premise of it is fun Parts of it I really enjoyed a lot and I think some of it's really well executed. The things that I didn't like very much about it is number one, it's not very body positive. Like I think 
they were trying to be that. I think they were trying to have a plus size main character, but she says and thinks so many negative things about her body like on a pretty regular basis and I didn't like the way that was handled. And it's not even super clear like whether she really is plus size or not. Like it's kind of odd. Like the only thing that we really get clear descriptions of is her feeling uncomfortable with her stomach and her having big boobs. And the guy likes her big boobs and that's supposed to make up for the rest of it. Like, I don't know. I didn't, yeah, I really, that kind of left a bad taste in my mouth. I didn't like the way that was handled and the way that it was linked to like eating food and stress eating. I don't know. It just, it wasn't, it wasn't handled very well. Didn't love that. Also, there are some things that happen at the end of the book that I didn't think were handled very well either. And they're plot spoilers, so I'm not going to get into too much detail about what it is. But I did not like it. I didn't think it was well handled. I didn't think that given the ending, I wanted the characters together, and that's also a problem. While I did think it was a really quick read, it was easy to get through, and there was a lot of it that I did really enjoy, those things definitely brought down my rating and made it a three star for me. So I don't know, maybe I'll try something else from Christina Lauren in the future, but I'm just not sure that they're necessarily the romance author for me because I'm kind of picky, especially about my contemporaries, but if you think there's something else that I might like, I'm open to possibly giving it a try. Next, I read His Hideous Heart, edited by Dahlia Adler. I really enjoyed this one. I gave it four and a half stars. This is a collection of 13 short stories by YA authors that are inspired by Edgar Allan Poe stories. So the first half of the book is those short stories, and the second half of the book is the original stories by Edgar Allan Poe that inspired them. I really love this as a project and as a collection. I think most of them are done really well. The thing that's particularly cool about this is that most of it is writing from the margins, which means that the way that the authors are writing, they're taking these kind of timeless themes from the stories by Edgar Allan Poe and then imagining how are these things different if the character telling the story is female or queer or a person of color and it puts a really interesting spin on them. So they're really well done in general. I think the lowest rating I gave in this collection was three stars. There were several that I gave five stars to, a lot I gave four and a half stars to, so overall I ended up landing on four and a half stars. I think it's a great project. I also like that it's introducing teens potentially to more classic literature and I just think it's really well well done. I actually, as this goes up, probably still have a giveaway happening if you guys want to enter. I will link that up above in my most recent book haul. This arc, I read an e-arc and this physical arc was sent to me by the publisher for that giveaway. So if you guys want to enter, that is available. But yeah, this one's coming out in September and um, I really liked it a lot. This month I also read quite the chunker of a book. This took me longer than I had anticipated it taking me to read actually. And this was the pick for the Patreon book club. That is The Secret History by Donna Tartt. I had been wanting to read this for quite a while. It's kind of a modern classic. It was published in the 1990s and it basically follows a group of pretentious, privileged white college students who end up committing murder and shows how they get to that point and then how it all falls apart afterward. And that's basically what this very long book does. Um, I did really enjoy it. I ended up giving this one four stars. I had kind of hoped that this would be a new favorite of mine. This has been compared a lot to If We Were Villains by M.L. Rio, which I read last year and loved, honestly. It probably should have made my favorites book of the year list just because it's stuck with me so long. So I was kind of hoping to have a similar experience with this book. But while I do think it's very well crafted, while I did generally enjoy it, it wasn't as much of a favorite, partly because of some pacing issues. Now, I also think that this is not going to be the book for everyone. I think if you don't like reading about pretentious, messed up, privileged white kids, <laughs> you're not going to enjoy reading The Secret History. I don't have a problem with that as long as the author is aware that these characters are unlikable and are who they are. And in this case, it's pretty obvious that the author knows that she's writing unlikable characters. Also, if you don't like reading books where there's no one that you can really root for, you might not like the secret history because honestly everybody in the book including the person telling the story is pretty messed up and has a lot of issues. There's also going to be a lot of content warnings for this book of things that show up that characters engage in or they get discussed. Obviously there is violence and murder but there's also homophobia, there's racism, there's sexism, there is incest, there are rituals and like 
all sorts of things in here definitely a lot of content warnings one of my biggest issues with this honestly was the pacing I do think it's too long it is it is a very long book it's well over 500 pages long and I don't really think it needed to be while the writing in general is beautiful I thought that chapters five through seven this whole book is eight chapters by the way like you get some really long chapters there's like eight chapters and an epilogue and I thought that chapters like five through seven were way too long, unnecessarily descriptive. They got a little bit slow for me. They were still interesting, but it, it could have been better paced and shortened a little bit in my opinion. But then in chapter eight, things really pick up again. Everything starts hitting the fan and things start falling apart and it's, it's pretty interesting. So those are my thoughts on The Secret History. I'm really happy that I read this. I mean, it is it is a tome, so I'm really proud of it. And it's a slower paced book. Honestly, this book took me quite a bit longer to read than I expected. A lot of the books that I read, I can kind of fly through and read a lot of pages pretty quickly. This one took me a little bit more time. It's a little slower paced. It's a little more dense to get through. Um, it's very character driven. So I'm happy I read it. I did enjoy it, but it's not a new favorite. So this one was four stars for me. This month I also read a new favorite book which I started in July, finished in August, and I have a complete non-spoiler review up for this right now which I will link up above if you guys want to check it out. This is Gideon the Ninth by Tamsin Muir. Um, I loved this. This was put on my radar because of Melanie from Mel Spieni. It is a debut novel coming out in September. It's being sold as lesbian necromancers in space, which is true, but also I don't think does this book justice or gives you a very good sense of what it is. I do talk in more detail about what I loved about it and who I think will enjoy this book because it is something that is not going to be for everyone for sure. So if you want to hear more of my thoughts on it, again, the spoiler free review is linked up above. But I really enjoyed this. It's a genre blend of sci-fi fantasy and closed circle mystery, which no one's really talking about. It's very character driven. You have to like Gideon as a character. I do think that fans of Nevernight by Jay Kristoff will probably love this book because it has a similar sense of humor and some similar sensibilities, even though the stories themselves are different. Again, if you want to hear more detailed thoughts, go check out that review where I get into more non-spoiler stuff but more information about this but I loved it this is a favorite for me of the year this which means I did give it six stars um very happy I read this but I'm curious to see how people respond to it as it comes out because I definitely don't think it's going to be the book for everyone but I think she's going to end up with a cult following much like Jay Kristoff people are going to love this or hate it this month I finished another book that I started last month I started this while I was on vacation in California put it down, didn't pick it up again, and I finally got around to finishing American Royals by Catherine McGee. This is another arc of a book that's coming out in September, and I really, really enjoyed it. It's a whole lot of fun, but I do have a caveat that I want to talk about. I ended up giving this one four and a half stars, and my one caveat, which I'll get to, is the thing that really kept this from being a five-star read for me. This is a super fun, soapy sort of book. It imagines an alternate American history where George Washington became king instead of president and now 200 plus years later we have an American royal family. I would say this is probably a little bit more on the new adult end of the spectrum. It doesn't really have any explicit content in it but the characters do trend a little older. I would say they're like 17 to 20 for the most part. I really enjoyed it. I think thematically it explores some really interesting things. I think the world that she creates with this reimagined American history is also pretty interesting. And it's fun if you like kind of frothy soapy stuff. There's betrayal and backstabbing and romance. There's also some really sweet moments and wonderful family dynamics that I loved. I There's like some really rich relationships in this and I really enjoyed all of the characters. Again, not going to be the book for everyone. I really enjoyed it. It's a very beachy sort of read. My one caveat that honestly kept this from being a five-star read for me is <laughs> there's kind of a big hole in the mythology that she's creating here where she does not once address the issues of slavery or Native Americans. Um, now, I would imagine that maybe she purposefully left those out because she just didn't want to touch them because the YA community sometimes can be kind of vicious occasionally towards female white authors who try to tackle those issues, so maybe she just didn't want to touch it. But unfortunately, it really doesn't make sense that way and it's kind of a problem and it's a little weird that it's left out given the way that she does address other issues. One of the main characters in this book, Nina, 
is best friends with one of the American princesses and she is Latinx and has two moms and so through that and through other things like Beatrice being the first female heir to the throne and with the potential of becoming queen she addresses some of these issues of sexism of certain elements of racism of homophobia and so some of that stuff does get addressed and so particularly because that is in here it feels like this gaping hole that she never once addresses slavery or Native Americans. We know that George Washington was a slave owner himself. None of that is touched on here, even though George Washington is a big historical figure and is talked about. It's just, it's just not discussed. And so for me, that was a bit of an issue. That's a pretty significant point in American history. And so if you're reimagining American history, you kind of need to address that. So while I found this to be really enjoyable, that was a big hole for me. I would hope that maybe this will be addressed in the next book. I think this is supposed to be a duology. I would definitely read on because I do think they're fun and worth picking up if it's the sort of book that you enjoy. But that brought my reading down a little bit and I ended up giving this one four and a half stars. The next book that I read was a patron pick. Every month my patrons are put into a raffle and whoever wins gets to select a book for my TBR that they want to see me read and review in the coming month. In August the winner was Jessie from the Tiny Tea Set and she wanted me to read The Furies of Calderon by Jim Butcher. This was one that I was able to get as an audiobook from my library pretty easily and I was pretty happy with this because I'd been interested in reading something from Jim Butcher anyway. Unfortunately, this book in particular didn't work so well for me, and I'll talk a little bit about why. There's sort of two pieces to this, but I am glad that I read something by him, and I think I'm still interested in trying one of his other books. I know he's got a big urban fantasy series. The name of it is escaping me right now, but I kind of want to try those at some point. I ended up giving this one two and a half stars which is not amazing. I do think some people will really enjoy this. Part of this is just a matter of personal taste in the types of fantasy that I enjoy reading. Another small part of this is the content, which I didn't love. Furies of Calderon is an adult kind of high fantasy that is very, very action driven. And if you guys have been watching my channel for a while, you might know that I really, really love fantasy that is character driven and driven by the world building with the action scenes being kind of a smaller piece of it. This was definitely not that. So I, while I enjoyed a, particularly the first part of the book where it was more about introducing the characters and introducing the world. I thought the magic system was really interesting. I wanted so much more from it. I wanted more character development. I wanted to know more about the politics and the different people groups and the way they fit together. I had a lot of questions that were kind of glossed over because this was really more driven by the action. In fact, pretty much the entire last third of the book is one long battle and for me that was just super boring like i know that people who like that sort of thing who are, enjoy reading all these like action fighting scenes will probably really like it but for me i'm like okay can we get to some character development can we talk about the political intrigue can we talk about the magic system <laughs> like it's just not my kind of fantasy um so while i appreciate that some people really love this series it, it just didn't work quite so well for me just because of the type of book that it was. So all of that would have probably made it a three star read for me where I was like, it's fine, but not really my thing. However, there were also a couple of issues that I had in terms of content that made me drop it another half star to two and a half stars. Now, to be fair, I gave this a little bit of a benefit of the doubt because this was written quite a while ago. I think this one came out in 2004. And so some of the issues that I had with it I would hope the author would address differently if he were to write it now. If I read a book with this kind of content now, I would give it a one star, <laughs> hands down. Um, but because it was written in 2004, I just dropped it by half star to two and a half stars. Two main issues that I have with it. Number one, there is a group of people in the book that feels like they're probably modeled on a combination of Native Americans and maybe Mayans. And it's in pretty poor taste. Uh, like this would get kind of pulled apart if it was done in this way today. I didn't really love it. They were painted as these barbarians who don't really wear a lot of clothing and who will like eat enemies alive and scalp people and it's just it's not done super well. <laughs> so that I didn't love. The other thing is this book feels kind of sexist and I don't get the sense that that was maybe the intention of the author but I think if this were written today it would for sure be targeted as having been that. Number one, 
all of the female characters who aren't heroes, who are like villains or who are morally gray, are very kind of forward with their sexuality. And it kind of smacks of like slut shaming. They like wear more scandalous clothes or are more seductive. And I'm like, okay, I just don't, I don't love that. I, like if that was the only thing, whatever, but I don't love it. The other thing though is that there's some like extended scenes that happen in the middle of the book that involve like a pretty horrific type of sexual assault that's fueled by magic that forces women to experience desire and pleasure against their will and it's it's pretty awful. Now while I don't necessarily have a problem with books that explore some of those things for real reasons where they're trying to explore why that's a problem, explore the issues with gendered sexual violence, that was not what this was doing. It really felt like it was being dramatized for shock value and it felt more salacious and I didn't like that. It felt kind of icky to me. Um, yeah. There was also a scene with some like real fuzzy consent with a age gap male female relationship. Just a lot of things that I know at that time we weren't talking in the same ways about sexual assault or about consent. So I give it like a little bit of a pass, kinda, um, but I still, that definitely took away from my enjoyment of it. So there you go. I understand why some people really love this if this is the type of fantasy that they enjoy, but for me it's not really my kind of fantasy. It's too action driven for me. And then some of these other content issues kind of detracted from my enjoyment of it. But yeah. I'm glad I read something by him and I would be open to trying out something else from him in the future. This month I also gave out a one and a half star rating, which if you know I pretty rarely give out one star or one and a half star. This was actually for an e-arc that I had for review and unfortunately this was really just not for me. This book was Just His Luck by BJ Daniels. It is a romantic suspense. I had read the first book in this series and really enjoyed it. I gave it four stars and so I thought I would try this one out. Unfortunately this one really didn't work for me. I did not enjoy my experience reading it. I didn't like some of the conventions that she used. There was also a lot of like teen angst and drama in it which was not what I went into it expecting. There are books that I'll read like American Royals for example that have that sort of thing and I don't mind it. I might enjoy it but in this case it really didn't work for me. I, clearly I'm in the minority because there are plenty of people giving this one four and, a, four and five stars, but sadly not not so much for me. If you want to hear more thoughts on it, again, I did write a Goodreads review where I get into it a little bit more in detail. On a more positive note, I gave five stars to The Death of Mrs. Westaway by Ruth Ware. I really enjoyed this. This is kind of like a mystery that involves a creepy house. This one is about a young woman who's in dire financial straits when she gets a letter telling her that she's inherited a lot of money from her grandmother who recently passed away. Now when she gets the letter she realizes that this is probably a case of mistaken identity because this is not her grandmother but she's in such desperate financial circumstances she decides to go anyway and see if she can get a little bit of money to help pay off her debts. Little does she know what she's getting herself into when she goes to this estate with this super messed up family and dark secrets start to come to the surface. It's very atmospheric. I really enjoyed it a whole lot. Like this was definitely a five star read for me. It went some directions that I wasn't expecting. To be fair this is not a genre I read a lot of but I just really enjoyed her writing style. I thought the characters were really interesting and I liked the settings. Um, so yeah, this was super fun. Five stars. Then I read another book that was a little bit of a disappointment. It wasn't bad, but it wasn't what I hoped it was going to be. This was actually one of my most anticipated books of the year, so I'm a little bummed that I didn't love it as much as I hoped I would. Uh, this is Deviant by Jay Kristoff, the sequel to Lifelike. This is his YA science fiction series. So last year Lifelike was one of my favorite books of the year. I loved it. I thought it was so smart, so well done. I loved the characters and the world. Everything about it just just was so good for me. Deviant mm, was fine. It was fine, um, which was kind of a bummer. I was hoping to love it. I ended up giving this one three stars. It wasn't bad, but it wasn't lifelike. Part of the issue probably is that the main character in this book is Lemon Fresh instead of Eve. Eve was the main character through most of Lifelike and I really really enjoyed that. I liked Lemon Fresh a lot as a side character but in this case she kind of goes off on her own adventure and 
it was fine. I just didn't care nearly as much. Most of the scenes that I found to be most interesting and most compelling were the few scenes where we did get Eve as a perspective character, but they were pretty few and far between, which was kind of a bummer. The plot was also pretty meandering. This felt like it definitely had second book syndrome where it was like moving pieces around but like not doing anything that interesting. I'm hoping that the finale, which is supposed to come out I think next year, will wrap it up in a way that's satisfying, but I just, it was fine. Like this whole book was mostly mediocre. It still had some interesting themes in it. It still had like a few interesting things that happened and you, I still like the world, but it was okay. <laughs> so that was kind of a disappointment. But then I also read Let's Call It a Doomsday by Katie Henry and I loved it. This one was a five star read for me. Um, last year, Heretics Anonymous, her debut novel, was one of my favorite books of the year, and Let's Call It a Doomsday is a very solid follow-up. They are standalone books, but they definitely have some similarities. I think Katie Henry is doing amazing work in YA in addressing some of the complexities of faith and religion, and it's a really tough line to walk, but I think she does it so well, where she doesn't invalidate faith and religious belief. She recognizes the value that it has and the importance of it, but also she pushes at and questions some of the issues that sometimes come along with religious institutions and with assuming that everybody needs to believe the same thing. And so Let's Call It a Doomsday continues in that vein and I think does it really, really well. The main character in this book is Mormon and deals with severe anxiety specifically she is obsessed with thinking that the end of the world is coming and prepping for natural disasters or end times. It's a book about friendship and family and finding yourself and sort of coming of age but also it deals with mental illness really really well. The main character goes to a therapist and I think those scenes are done so well. It deals with severe anxiety, it deals with intrusive thoughts, and I love this. I think this is going to be such an important book, especially with the mental health representation for people who are dealing with those sorts of things and might not recognize it for what it is. The way that the religion in the book is handled is also just so well done, so nuanced. She wrestles with this push-pull of sometimes valuing your faith and valuing your faith community and believing in God, but maybe also having some issues with some of the things that your church says that they believe. And in this case, she addresses the issue of sexuality. The main character is questioning whether she might be bisexual, although she doesn't really want to label it at this point. She's still kind of figuring it out, but obviously that's something that officially is not accepted within the Mormon community. And I just think it's so well done. Um, yeah, really loved it. Gave us one five stars. It's also really quirky and funny and has a lot of like academic humor in it. So yeah, really love it. I'm loving Katie Henry and I'll probably read whatever she puts out. All right, three more books to talk about. First was another audiobook and I'm so happy I finally got around to this. This is Murder of Crows by Ann Bishop, the sequel to Written and Read. Written in Red was also like on my favorites of the year list last year and Murder of Crows was so so good. I'm so happy. I forgot how much I just love these characters and love this world and it was just so enjoyable to get back into this. So I have already requested book three from my library on audio because these are books that I really really enjoy and want to continue on with pretty quickly. So um, since I've had a hard time getting to them in physical form, I'm going to do them as audiobooks. The audiobooks are really good. This is an adult kind of paranormal series where non-human creatures and life forms and people exist. So vampires, werewolves, elementals, other shapeshifters exist and they pretty much own American land and lease it to humans in exchange for some of their technology. And there's like really, really good world building. It's really interesting. But the thing I love about it is the characters. Meg is the main character and she's what's called a Sandra Sang or a blood prophet, which means that when she cuts her skin and bleeds, she sees prophecies. And um, so definitely there's gonna be some content warnings for that and other things in here. This is definitely adult, it's not YA. It's got plenty of like content stuff in it but I just love it. I love her as a character. She's so sweet and funny, but not in a way that's unlikable, and she's perfectly balanced out by some of the characters around her, like werewolves and grizzly bear shapeshifters who are kind of gruff, and I just, it's just so good. It's so cute. The relationships are slow burn and wonderful, and there's like funny moments, and the world building is so good. These are cozy, very character driven, um, but still have plenty of plot and political intrigue and mystery to them. So yeah, this was clearly 
five stars, maybe six, definitely five stars for, for, for sure. Um, yeah, and I really look forward to continuing on with the series. I love it. I also finished reading Serpent and Dove by Shelby Mahurin. This one I did as a buddy read with Isabella from the Feminist Bookworm over on Instagram. If you guys want to check her out, I will link her Instagram down below. She's been great. This is the second book we've buddy read together, and I really, really enjoyed this. I think I'm actually going to make a complete review video for Serpent and Dove if you guys want to check that one out. This is a highly anticipated YA release, new adult new adult release. It's coming out in September and it is a fantasy romance recommended for fans of Sarah J Maas. I agree. I also think that even people that don't love Sarah J Maas but like the idea of fantasy romance might really really love this. This is one of my favorite romances that I've read this year. It is a debut novel and so in terms of just pure writing craft there are a few things that maybe could have been done better but this was just such an enjoyable reading experience. The romance was like so good. It's more diverse. It's more thematically rich. I just I loved it. I will definitely be buying a finished copy of this and again I'll do more of an in-depth review if you guys want to hear more detailed thoughts on this. But yeah I really liked it. I think this one is also probably going to be five stars for me even though it wasn't perfect in terms of crafting. It was just so enjoyable and the romance was so well done. This is a enemies to lovers romance with a marriage of convenience plot and I love both of those things and I, it's just it's it's so good. It's so well done. Um, it also is really interesting because it explores religion as it can be positive and as it can be negative and sexism and there's witches and it's lots of morally gray characters. This is like catnip guys. It's so good. So much fun. And the final thing that I've read so far I devoured yesterday like in a single day. This is definitely one I would recommend binge reading. This is Inspection by Josh Mallerman. He's the author of Bird Box and this was so good. Now again I'm gonna have a caveat on this. I did give this one four stars because there's a big gaping plot hole in this, but that aside, it's so fun and so enjoyable to read. I did listen to a lot of this on audio and read some of it physically, and the audiobook is fantastic if you want to listen to it. So the basic premise of Inspection is that all of these kids have been raised in these gender segregated facilities. They're raised not knowing that the opposite gender exists, with the theory that the opposite sex is a distraction and if they're raised this way they will be more productive in terms of becoming brilliant scientists or engineers or whatever. That's kind of the idea. However, of course, there are some like creepy and abusive things going on and things go very, very wrong. Um, it's really good. I couldn't put it down. I wanted to read it all the way to the end. I devoured this whole thing in a day and I think it's it's very readable. It's really well done. A whole lot of fun. Big gaping plot hole in this is this assumes that none of these boys and girls will ever be queer. Like, and that was a big thing for me where I was like, okay, but you're assuming, because it starts off talking about the boys. I'm like, you're assuming that none of these boys are going to be gay and that somehow just them not knowing women exist will sort of keep their sexuality from becoming a thing and not express itself in other ways. Like, that seems highly unlikely to me, uh, but so, so that's a bit of an issue. I did give this one four stars, partly because of that, but that aside, it's very enjoyable and it's very bingeable. So if this is the sort of book that you like, I would recommend it. There you have it. Those are the 13 books that I've read so far in August. I'm feeling really good about my reading. I'm getting to a lot of the things that were on my TBR. I am enjoying a lot of the things that I'm reading, but I've definitely had some disappointments and some misses as well, which, you know, it all balances out. In July, I read so many five-star books. I guess I was bound to have some lower rated ones this month, but overall, I'm really happy with how it's gone. Talk to me in the comments down below. Let me know what any of your thoughts on any of the books that I talked about. And for your question of the day, let me know what is a book that's coming out this fall that you're really anticipating picking up. It could be one of the books I talked about or it could be something else. Let me know. If you guys like this video, give it a thumbs up. Subscribe if you want to see more. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time.